When you travel, you realize each country has its own 4th of July. It's kind of exciting. I used to think it was just the 4th of July, but in Norway it's May 17, here in Switzerland, August 1st, France is 10 days late, July 14. Uh, and uh, when, you, when you travel around, you find that everybody has their own dream. I was raised thinking everybody had the American dream, and then I realized that smart people didn't have the American dream. That's not a negative thing, that's a celebration. In Sri Lanka, they've got the Sri Lankan dream. It's different than my dream. Norwegians like being Norwegian. Bulgarians like being Bulgarian. I've traveled a lot in Bulgaria. I'm surprised anybody's still there. <laughs> it blows me away that people decide to live their lives out in Bulgaria. But I'm humble enough to realize I don't get it. They like being Bulgarian. They might not want to live here. I might not want to live there. It's okay. He had a chip on his shoulder about this. And I thought, okay, I guess if I ate with my fingers, I might think these guys who eat with spoons and fork thought less of me. But it's just their culture. And I gave that some serious thought. For the rest of my trip through South Asia, I ate when appropriate with my fingers, what God intended them to be used for. And it actually got quite elegant. I would go to fancy restaurants filled with professional people, well-dressed people, without a spoon or fork in sight. Fancy ceremonial sink in the middle of the restaurant, people would wash their hands and eat with their fingers. It became quite natural. In fact, I had to be retrained when I got home. <laughs> when you travel, you will find that there are exciting struggles going on today that we don't recognize. I was raised thinking Ethan Allen and Nathan Hale and Patrick Henry just like were the ultimate, right? Guys that only wish they had more than one life to give for their country. And then I've traveled and I've learned that these kind of guys are a dime a dozen on this planet. It's not an unpatriotic thing to say, it's just we're not unique in having great patriot heroes. And every year on this planet, five languages go extinct. No fanfare, no green peace to, to mourn their loss. It's just that last person who speaks that language dies and one little bit less of ethnic diversity on this planet. It's a remarkable thing. Now, a lot of, I mean, these are such obscure little groups that they hardly know or notice, but a lot of these groups don't go out you know, politely. They do angry things as they're losing their struggle. And it's really exciting in your travels to learn about what the struggles are in a particular country you're visiting and then empathize with the underdogs. Who are their heroes? A very easy one to get your brain around if you want is a contemporary hero, uh, uh, Archbishop Oscar Romero. Of course, Archbishop Romero was the popular sort of leader of the peasants uh, and, and uh, the liberation theology kind of gang down in El Salvador in the 1980s during their civil war. And he predicted that he would be shot and killed and he would rise again in his people. And he was assassinated and he has certainly risen in his people. And I'll tell you, I've never been so inspired as to go down there and march with the people of El Salvador when they remember their Nathan Hale, who was just shot a few years ago. A couple of, back in, Five years ago, I, had, I was ready for a vacation. Our family was going to go to Mazatlan, and I was just, I needed a break. I wanted a pristine peach, piece of tropical beach, swept free of local riffraff, just for me to relax. And then they invited me to go to El Salvador, because it's the 25th anniversary of the assassination of Archbishop Oscar Romero. And I told my family, I'm going to be no fun on the beach in Mazatlan. I've got to go to El Salvador. And uh, so they went to the beach, I went to San Salvador, covered with bug bites in a sweaty dorm, eating rice and beans one day and beans and rice the next. Uh, connecting with the people of Central America. It was one of the richest travel experiences I've ever had. Perfectly safe, cost half of what a vacation in Mazatlan cost, changed my whole life. I mean, it's, it's not right or wrong, but you have that option in your travels to go to Managua instead of Mazatlan. I'm going to Managua for Christmas this year and then I'm going to go to El Salvador, and then I'm going to go to Mexico City for New Year's. It's going to be great. It's going to be challenging. I'll need a little break when I get home, but I'm going to come home having learned about, you know, the biggest city on the planet and what it's like to be on the receiving end of globalization. What's it like to be in a little country that no longer has its own coins? El Salvador is dollarized. They got nickels and quarters. They got our presidents. There's a Wendy's on every corner now. You know, it's a different, there's armed guards in the middle class neighborhoods because there's such a gap between rich and poor. It's an amazing story that most of us would be oblivious to if we weren't perverse enough to choose to go there and learn about it. Nobody's going to tell you about it here. I was marching with all the people there in El Salvador, and one of the stops on that march was a monument that 
looks very much like a monument we all know and love. This is the monument in the capital of El Salvador, which is a perfect knockoff of our Vietnam Memorial. And this granite has just as many names carved into it as ours does. And each one of these people died fighting you and me. We killed them. Now maybe they were communists and we had to kill them. I'm not gonna get into that. But the fact is they're dead and we paid for the bullets and the bombs that killed them. That's a heritage that these people live with. And every day there's loved ones at this wall thinking about their lost loved ones and thinking about America. It's just a poignant thing. I don't know what conclusions to draw, but it's something that's very real.